Ladies and gentlemen, can I begin by uh, welcoming you here tonight um, and start by introducing myself. I'm Professor Paul Kelly and I'm a pro-director of the school. Um, I'm here um, deputing for Craig Calhoun who unfortunately is um, double booked so um, he can't be chairing this meeting. I'd like, you to, I'd like to welcome you especially tonight um, as this is the first Steve Biko Memorial Lecture at LSE, so it's a very special occasion for us. And I'd like to draw your attention to a couple of sort of housekeeping issues by way of start. So these things are very, very important. So can I just first begin by drawing your attention to the hashtag for tonight's event, which is hash LSE Biko. And also remind you that this event is being recorded so when we come to the question and answer session after Barney's lecture, um, can I urge you to um, wait until microphones come so that we can capture the, the question and answer session properly. As this is a joint event between the LSE and the Steve Biko Foundation, I'd like to extend a particularly warm welcome to friends and associates of the Foundation who are with us today. Um, students of my generation in the late 70s well remember the image and the activism of Steve Biko and it's wonderful that the school is able to partly acknowledge his important work by hosting the lecture here tonight. I'm delighted in particular to welcome our speaker, the Reverend Canon Professor Barney Pichiana. I'll say more about him in just a moment. But first, it's appropriate, given that this is a co-hosted lecture, to introduce <coughs> Mr. Nkosinati Biko, who is um, the eldest child of Steve Biko, and is, more importantly for our purposes, the CEO of the Steve Biko Foundation. And I'd like to invite him to come up and say a little bit about the foundation first before I introduce our speaker proper. So. Thank you, Professor Kelly. I have been given exactly three minutes to introduce the lecture. I'm counting. And my immediate complaint to my colleague and director of international partnerships, Ms. Obenwa Amponsa, was that the time allocated for this purpose is totally un African. <laughs> Knowing how involved the process of exchanging pleasantry is the father of Pan-Africanism in South Africa, Robert Sobukwe, once warned us that if you don't have time, you don't even venture to ask an African how they are doing. <laughs> and this is because the process tends to be very, very generous in its account of uh, who died, who was born, who got married, and of course in its account of uh, the performance of the field, the cattle, and the weather. So to save you and my remaining two minutes from all of that detail, let me acknowledge you all in uh, the special South African palace, and we simply say all protocol is observed. Um, I see a few familiar faces here, and at the least, let me acknowledge the institutions that are represented, the Steve Biko Housing Association, the Franz Fanon Foundation, the Donald Woods uh, Foundation, friends of Portier, and of course, special friends such as uh, Cecilia Kentridge, who represented the Biko family in the inquest into the matter of Steve Biko, uh, the former British High Commissioner to South Africa, Paul Boateng, and uh, Professor Ben Okri, who was in South Africa with us recently. A few months ago, the Steve Biko Foundation through the office of Ms. Amponsa, together with the uh, London Economics uh, Office of Mr. Mark Melanie, entered into a formal partnership to co-host the Steve Biko Memorial Lecture Europe. The lecture is built on the foundation's tradition 
of promoting an interrogative culture amongst citizens. We argue at the foundation that the discourse on development is often framed in reference to the more physical assets of nations. So in the case of South Africa, our national development plans are unambiguous in relation to the miles of roads that we need to build, the number of power stations the economy requires, together with water connections, houses, schools, and hospitals that need to be constructed. And of course, all of these are very, very important in the process of building a nation. However, oftentimes development planning terminates prematurely at this point and fails to appreciate the centrality of the less tangible national assets such as culture, values, identity, and the issues that relate to giving luster to the flag of a nation, the issues that speak to the soul of the nation. Our institutional hypothesis is that these essential elements are a characteristic of societies that have a healthy culture of citizen engagement and of dialogue. Accordingly, central to the work of the Steve Biko Foundation is the objective of creating spaces for critical analysis and engagement with vital social, economic, and political issues. And we do this in the hope of contributing to strengthening democracies in the countries in which we operate. Like many other perceived uh, economic havens, there is, of course, a growing discomfort in Europe around the newly emerging European identity. And I think that the large influx of communities such as the Muslim community and African communities, among others, coupled with the economic difficulties of the recent past, has placed an enormous pressure on the politics of our neighborhoods. Incidents of intolerance, and the rise of the politics of the right are reported in England, France, uh, in the Netherlands, as they are in South Africa and many others. It's against this and other challenges of diversity that a number of partners of the foundation have expressed a desire to have a dialogue platform that brings the experience of South Africa and of Africa into conversation with the experience of this region. In part, this platform therefore is intended as a platform that should be what uh, Professor Njabulo Ndebele calls a resuscitative moment on the national calendar. And if it is to be true to the tradition that inspires it, then it cannot be that it is given to politics of comfort. Similarly, it has to inspire us to narrow the gap between ideas, citizenship, and social action. We were drawn, of course, to LSE, one of the foremost social science universities in the world, because of its expressed commitment of engaging with the wider society. And we look forward to a long relationship with LSE. Now, one of the leading figures of the tradition I am speaking of is Professor Bikyan, and my duty is not to introduce him tonight. Suffice to say that we are fortunate to have him give this opening lecture. As a leading member of the Black Consciousness Movement, he helped create a vibrant movement in the late 60s that saw South Africa awaken from a political love. In a way, then, as we start this lecture, we are going back to the roots of the legacy that inspires it. And today, Professor Pichana remains one of the most outspoken voices of reason in our continent. He is the absolute embodiment of the teachings of his movement, a citizen who has been able to integrate the personal, the professional, and the political. And believe you me, he is not one to shy away from a good fight if it is in defense of a good, pro of a good cause. So on behalf of Steve Eco Foundation and the London School of Economics, I'd like to thank you, Professor Pichana, and to thank Mrs. Pichana, your beautiful wife and fellow activist, for gracing us with your presence. I would also like to thank those who have taken the time to join us today Please enjoy, share, and come back for more. Thank you very much, Mr. Beaker. Uh, let me follow um, 
that par partial introduction of tonight's speaker with a slightly fuller one for the record as well as we are recording this. We are delighted tonight to have here, to give this first um, Steve Biko Memorial Lecture at LSE, the Reverend Canon Professor Barney Pajana. He's a lawyer, a theologian, an academic, and a notable human rights activist, amongst the other things that we've also been told about. Born on the 7th of August 1945, he went on to attend the University of Fort Hare and to help found the Black Consciousness Movement <coughs> alongside Steve Beaker. He received a law degree from the University of South Africa in 1976, but was barred from practicing law by the apartheid government. <coughs> Professor Pichana went into exile in 1978 and came to the UK to study law and Anglican ministry. Having served the Anglican Church in Milton Keynes in Birmingham, he was director of the program to combat racism at the World Council of Churches in Geneva from 1988 until 1992. <coughs> Professor Pichana returned to South Africa in 1993 following the end of apartheid and continued working in theology and human rights, and completed a PhD at the University of Cape Town in 1995, no small achievement. He served as chair of the South African Human Rights Commission from 95 to 2001. He's also served on the African Commission on Human Rights and People's Rights at the Organization of African Unity. He has been awarded an honorable mention in the 2002 UNESCO Prize for Human Rights Education. Presently, Professor Pachiano is Rector of the College of Transfiguration in Grahamstown, South Africa, a post he took up having served previously as Principal and Vice-Chancellor of the University of South Africa from 2001 to 2010. I shouldn't really mention this because Rick Trainer isn't here. He's also a fellow of somewhere called King's College London, but I, I, I know that. <laughs> I practiced that for a long time. <laughs> the title of tonight's lecture is Black Consciousness, Black Theology, Student Activism and the Shaping of a New South Africa. Can I welcome tonight's speaker, Reverend Barney Pichar. Kelly, thank you very much, and Gosnati, thank you very much, Obinara, thank you very much uh, for inviting me here. It's wonderful to see so many of you who are friends and many whom we have known over a very long time. I, I cannot resist, uh, Professor Kelly, but to say, being a Kingsman uh, <coughs> and appearing on an LSE platform uh, is an act of betrayal. <laughs> Uh, I recall during the time I was at King's, uh, Sir Richard Way was the principal and King's was celebrating, um, uh, I think, 150, 150th anniversary. And on Radio 4 in the morning, the principal was being asked, why was it that uh, King's College, right opposite LSE, was not affected by the 1968 student uprisings? And Sir Richard Way said, well, of course, you must understand that at King's College, we train professionals. <laughs> we train doctors, we train lawyers, we train theologians, we train army professionals, generals. At LSE, they train sociologists <laughs> and political scientists. And they do tend to have the tendency of experimenting um, with people. And that is why at King's we had purposeful people who had going into professions. And at, um, at LSE, uh, they were going into the streets. <laughs> and so it is actually very good to be here uh, today. Thank you very much for the invitation. Let a new earth arise. Let another world be born. Let a bloody peace be written in the sky. Let a second generation 
full of courage issue forth, let a people loving freedom come to growth, let a beauty full of healing and a strength of final <coughs> clenching be the passing of our spirits and of our blood. Let the martial songs be written, let the dirges disappear, let a race of men rise and take control. An excerpt from a poem by Margaret Walker from my people. The idea of black consciousness reflected a generation of students in our country wrestling with the fundamental questions of human existence. It was a search for answers, answers that each generation must needs ask of itself and of its elders. In some sense, these were questions that were never answered definitively because the questions kept arising each time the question was asked. For our generation of university students in the 1960s in apartheid South Africa, we are very much aware of the era of repression and the apparent triumph of the, of, of the forces of oppression and injustice. We are aware that these forces of white minority rule preceded the onset of apartheid as official policy in our country in 1948 and could be traced back to British colonial policy in the 19th century. We are aware that there had been wave upon wave of resistance by African people to the onslaught of land dispossession and political exclusion, but that again and again our people lost, but they never surrendered the right to self-determination, to the integrity of their humanity and preservation of their culture and mores. With each defeat, the British and other European settlers consolidated their power, culminating in the South African War of roughly two foreign nations fighting among themselves for dominance over our patrimony, without our will and without our participation. <coughs> the result, as historians will tell us, was the establishment of a white settler pact in 1910 that led inexorably to the Statute of Westminster in 1931, granting what was a dominion colonial state virtual independence within the Commonwealth. Now, behind that brief outline of the historical events lay intriguing and curious questions for us. Why was it that all the wars of resistance throughout the 19th century never yielded any result that established sovereignty by the indigenous peoples of Africa over their land, their resources, and their humanity. How did it come about that we, the black indigenous people of this continent, appear to be complicit in our own oppression? And why was it that our life and cultures and destiny appeared to be in the hands of foreign powers? By the 1960s in South Africa, apartheid had consolidated itself. An Africana Republic had been established outside of the Commonwealth, and minority rule had been further entrenched as not just ruled by the white minority, but even further ruled by and in favor of the Africana folk. With it, the rest of the white community fell into line and was complicit, and the international community seemed powerless to bring this unjust situation to an end. It was the worst of times, and it was the best of times. New efforts at resistance seemed to come to naught. Nelson Mandela, Robert Subukwe, and others were languishing in Robben Island. Oliver Tambo was in exile. All credible political organizations were banned, and communities were gripped and paralyzed by fear, and uncertainty and despair were in the air. In their place, we were being asked to recognize as leaders Quislings and collaborators with the system who saw no need for resistance and acted as agents of disempowerment. The Badustans were, in our view, a big lie. A big lie of the apartheid system that claimed that there was anything like separate but equal, or that there was designated land that belonged to the black people who had to be divided up into enclaves of despair and abandonment. Gradually, they emerged into this mix of ideologies, a strange mix of bedfellows, 
in the name of the English press and the white opposition parties that claimed the mantle of the Cape liberal tradition, we are now arguing for an alleviation of the bad aspects of the system of repressive, le repressive legislation. In other words, we emerged as spokespersons of the oppressed majority. It is also correct, I think, to flag at this early stage that part of the perplexity that was, it was, was to us fundamentally a matter of faith. It suggested that the culture and history of Africa could not withstand and resist successfully any assault on the personhood of being African. Perhaps for those who professed any faith, it was the contrasting ways in which the Christian faith was expressed and the incoherence of a faith that seemed to allow oppression of one by another and tolerated the evil that masqueraded as Christian. It was out of this conflict of faith that further articulations of faith emerged. It was also the best of times because such periods saw the flourishing of new ideas and of idealism. It was a time of searching for the authentic and of discovery of the ideal of unity and solidarity. It was a time of affirming and the discovery of Africa and African culture and values. It was a counter-assertion of the right to human dignity. My memory of that time is that it was a restoration of the ideal of humanity and the assertion of freedom. The question that this paper addresses, therefore, is how such principles evolved, and indeed, what could have been their denouement into becoming the foundations of a freedom struggle founded on values, and what was the contribution of black consciousness in shaping the democratic South Africa that we know today. This address examines an even deeper and perhaps troubling question for our time. And that is how do young people and students in our time shape their own destiny today? <clears throat> Part of the grand design of apartheid ideology was separation. <coughs> Black people had to be separated from white people, not just by mere race characteristics, but by the color of their skin. And Black people had to be separated between African colored and Indian and African people had to be separated into their various ethnic and language groups. There was, you see, an amazing fascination about separation as the law of state, hence the word apartheid. Well, the Separate Universities Act was enacted in 1959 and came into force in 1960. It created new universities for the various black groups and excluded them from attendance at not just white universities, but also in any universities not of one's own group or race. This process, of course, was met by widespread resistance as the very ideal of a university was under challenge. On the other hand, a culture of resistance to the system became entrenched and the subaltern culture was celebrated. That culture was in ideas and their interpretation, in reading into <coughs> literature and history the true stories of Africa, and that developed an underground railroad of literature that was banned and forbidden to be possessed. It was to that mixture of curiosity, inquisitiveness, and daring that black consciousness emerged as a new challenge to the apartheid dictate. But there was more. The mid-1960s marked the coming to fruition of the independence movements of Africa. Near our home, the British protectorates were granted independence in 1966, and one by one, the idea of independence became established in Africa. South Africa therefore became more of an anomaly in our view. Then, there was the civil rights movement in the United States. That produced valuable literature that became the diet of the would-be revolutionaries that we fancied ourselves to be. But more importantly, it gave credence to the spirit of resistance in our own situation. Finally, this period coincided with the student revolts in parts of Europe in 1968, as well as the massive resistance to the Vietnam War in the United States. And this gave impetus to students and young people as agents of social change. In South Africa, 1968 saw the student activism 
around the non-appointment of Dr. A.B.M. Mofedje as lecturer at the University of Cape Town by reason of the government's determination that to do so would be contrary to policy. Looking back in time, it interests me that Hegel had become a very influential philosopher and aspiring partner for those of us who were seeking answers, and out of which even more questions were raised. The very idea of consciousness is quintessentially, as Steve would say, Hegelian. It suggests not just a psychological state of mind, in my view, but an inner being, a personality who thinks and acts. In other words, Hegel offered a ringing denunciation of the apartheid philosophy. As F.G. Weiss in his introduction to Hegel's essential writing puts it, towards the great ideas of one's time there must be no complacency, and that, and I quote, conceit may be the best way, unquote, to approach any great thinkers. But to put it differently, it also gave intellectual license to interrogate and challenge received ideas, resist their hegemony and construct one's own set of ideas and knowledge systems. Perhaps, perhaps the reason that Hegel had such influence was not simply that Hegel was not among the banned pieces of literature, <coughs> however true that was, but that Marxism beyond the communist manifesto just did not speak to our experience, and that meant that we could not be Marxian post-Hegelians. The idea that we had to analyze our human experience and discover and articulate the essence of who we were, and I quote, a subject becomes substance, creating out of itself by transforming itself and cancelling within itself a myriad of inadequate forms of its own truth. Hegel also had attraction, not simply as a philosopher of consciousness, but also of freedom. Consciousness in the Hegelian construct is freedom because it raises the capacity of willing the impossible to become possible, to think out of the box and to shape one's destiny. In his lectures in philosophy, the following appears, and I quote, the life of God and all the deeds of time are the struggles for spirit to know itself, to make itself objective to itself, to find itself, be itself, be for itself, and finally unite itself to itself. It is alienated and divided, but only so as to be able thus to find itself and return to itself. Only in this manner does spirit attain its freedom, for that is free, which is connected with or dependent on another." Unquote. Intellectual life, therefore, was about the search for the truth and a challenge to some of the putative truth claims that were restricting freedom. For us, this was, and Steve Hugo was fascinated by this idea of acknowledging difference, and yet differences being fused into the new, the Hegelian syllogism, and I quote, an undivided unity of differences, which is enriched rather than dissipated by the multitude of its manifestations, unquote. This is sometimes referred to as the principle of the identity of opposites, of knowing and being a synthesis <coughs> of opposites. But there was more to it. It was that the oppressed people must give themselves the freedom to rebel against oppression and to thereby free themselves in their thinking that they would dare to imagine another possibility. In other words, the big idea was to be the big question mark, one which uh, Fiore expresses well in his biography of Antonio Gramsci, and I quote, in the acceptance by the ruled of a conception of the world which belongs to the rulers, those ideas of the world that appear to make common sense, the philosophy of the masses who accept the morality, customs, the institutionalized rules of behavior of the society they live in. The problem is to understand how the ruling classes had managed to win the consent of the subordinate classes." Unquote. I also believe that at this time Herbert Marcuse's seminal work, The One-Dimensional Man, was persuasive. 
In it, we became aware of the pressures in society through vested interests who control the media, the church, and education, who viewed society from their own lenses of privilege and power, and whose messages reinforced the ideology of privilege and justifications of the status quo. This is how he put it. One dimension of thought is systematically promoted by the makers of politics and the purveyors of mass information. Their universe of discourse is populated by self-validating hypotheses, which necessarily and monopolistically repeated become hypnotic definitions and dictations." Unquote. From this we got to understand that what we rejected was not just by a strangeness in our thought processes. We instinctively understood that a one-dimensional view of the world must be challenged and must be examined in order to understand and expose its true foundations. <clears throat> now, I offer this outline of Hegelian philosophy not because I suggest that we were unreconstructed or new Hegelians, but so that one should understand the intellectual environment that prevailed and how that environment drew from and sought to analyze and understand the dynamics of our human experience. I also argue that it is difficult to understand black consciousness and Steve Bieber properly unless one engages with the intellectual sources he tried to make sense of for himself. Much of the studies of black consciousness that I have come across, in my view, miss this dimension that gives power and resilience to black consciousness. In other words, engagement with philosophy brought into sharp relief the depravity of the environment that we sought to challenge. It is very interesting to note that in the struggles for freedom, Hegel has a special place. Hegel was, I assume, an interlocutor for Marx as much as he was for Antonio Gramsci, for Martin Luther King Jr., for Franz Fanon. It is of interest that Anton Lamberde, the founding president of the ANC Youth League in 1948, wrote a master's dissertation on Hegel's theory of religion. Those who were threatened by black consciousness in the political contestations of the 1970s delighted in presenting black consciousness as lacking in revolutionary intent and confining the idea of consciousness to a mere psychological aberration. To the detractors of black consciousness, I can only offer this thought from Gramsci once again. Man is above all mind, all else mind consciousness. That is, he is a product of history, not of nature. Man has only been able to acquire a sense of his worth bit by bit, in one sector of society after another. And such awareness was not generated out of brute psychological needs, but out of intelligent reasoning. First of all, by a few, and later on by entire classes who perceived the causes of certain social facts and understood that there might be ways of converting the structure of repression into one of rebellion and social reconstruction. This means that every revolution has been preceded by an intense labor of social criticism, of cultural penetration and diffusion." Unquote. Now, these detractors couldn't have been further from the truth. Indeed, that would not just be a misreading of Steve Biko, but a misunderstanding of Hegel. Consciousness is about truth, about reality. It is concrete as much as it is material. It is, if you like, the ultimate being. But this intellectual environment did not begin and end with Hegel. It was taken up in the studies of Franz Fanon's Wretched of the Earth. Like Steve Biko and Black Consciousness, there is a resurgence of interest in Franz Fanon in South Africa today, judging by the publications and conferences of Fanon coming out. It is also heartening that there is recognition that Franz Fanon in Steve Biko's generation offered a stinging critique of the post-liberation practice in Algeria and elsewhere in Africa. It warned against practices that would undermine the value of the struggle and consign the new Africa into forms of subjugation not much different from those under colonial rule. 
Fanon was important in our time because he offered a theory of liberation affirming its core values and then offered the analytical tools of understanding where that vision faces betrayal. The psychiatrist from the Caribbean island of Martinique who participated in the freedom struggle of Algeria and later committed his life to the people of Africa was not just a Che Guevara, a roving professional revolutionary, but an idealist who believed that revolution would have no meaning if it did not have an abiding value for the people who were liberated. Fanon gave Steve Biko the analytical tools to critique the various manifestations of social control and collaborationism that helped Steve Biko to understand the mind of the oppressed and the various stratagems of social control of the oppressive classes. I suggest that Fanon helped Steve Biko with his analysis of the cult of fear among the oppressed and the truth about black people participating in their own oppression. It also helped him to expose the role of the liberals in denying the oppressed the duty to be their own lib liberators. Frankly, nobody had ever done such an analysis, an analysis before Steve Biko in the various phases of the liberation process in South Africa. What it, what it was, was that with every push there was defeat, and the ideal of freedom was expressed as a rallying call to action. With it, there was an appeal to universal principles of humanity, as well as of religious, mainly Christian anthropology. Steve Biko chose to address the reasons, the reasons for the failure to succeed in our collective efforts. That was because we may not have paid sufficient attention to the psychology of oppression. Now, based as we were in Durban with many Gandhian activists in our midst, one must not forget that training in Mahatma Gandhi's Satyagraha principles was also very important. At Phoenix Settlement, originally founded by Gandhi as an ashram for Satyagraha activists, one must never underestimate the ethical force of Gandhi's seven deadly sins. Politics without principle, wealth without work, commerce without morality, pleasure without conscience, education without character, science without humanity, and worship without sacrifice. These suggested to us a moral practice that was compelling and a means of providing a critique for a society that acted without morality. Black consciousness sought to provide society with just such a critique. Any study of Steve Biko can never be complete without a reference to his approach to religion and the role of the church. What Steve Biko had to say about the church's role in colonization was not new. Neither was his critique of the church during white minority rule and apartheid. It was at best hesitant, but most likely implicit. He therefore sought to understand how black people themselves could overwhelmingly advance a religious consciousness that was undermining their human dignity and that was not able to practice what it taught. His approach was not a wholesale condemnation of religion in the church. Instead, he drew from a long history of Christian resistance by black post-missionary Christians to the hegemony and control of the church by European missionaries. For that, he had some powerful examples in Nehemiah Tile and the Temple Church and of the Ethiopian movement and Mangena Mukone. In the apocalyptic millenarian movements of the Mgijimas and the Nazarites in, Bul in Buluk, in John Colenso and the challenge of cultural interpretation of the Bible among the Zulus, and of the more contemporary mass indigenous churches of Shembe and the Fanyane, even to the manifestations of independent theological thought of the African indigenous churches of the Zionists, charismatic and healing <coughs> churches. It was evident that for many Africans, the option was not to turn their backs on Christianity, but to reinterpret and practice the Christian faith by taking account of African cultures, by asserting their independence to and leadership by Africans themselves, and express the freedom to syncretize Christian practices with African culture and rituals. There was therefore a view that to attack Christianity especially, and the church in particular, 
was bound to be alienating and would be counterproductive. Besides, it was understood that with the demise of the church, a whole set of values and ethical positions necessary for constructing an ethic of resistance would be gone. A process of critical reconstruction, therefore, was obvious. The effect was to build on the compelling nature of religion, but undergird it with an equally compelling culture that is of the essence of being African. This process produced a sensitive and respectful understanding of the beliefs and the practices of others and threw them into the liberatory circle. The tool for this examination came in the form of black theology. Black theology brought about a credible theological critique of the traditional theology and the church that black consciousness had become suspicious of, but it did not have the theological expertise to dissect except to criticize its effect in the minds of the people and in Christian practice. Black theology provided a fundamental critical evaluation, but it also led to a credible substitution without falling foul of the essential or core fundamentals of the faith. Black theology made revolutionary action for liberation possible. In a way, this was held by the post-Vatican II liberation theology and theologian culture movements. Literature became available that truly spoke to the experience of Christians in situations of oppression. From, from Latin America, the Sandinistas in Nicaragua provided a partnership between the church in revolution and a people's movement founded on faith practice. Finally, it would be remiss of me to end this outline of black consciousness practice without a reference to students and their role in development. It was a fundamental principle of black consciousness that the students who were to view themselves as agents of social change should never accept the definitions and expectations of others of themselves. As such, students had to live in the liberatory ethic they espouse and express their unity with the communities they came from and which they intended and hoped to serve. This was a very important principle. It affirmed that students were never, by their standard of education, ceasing to be who they were. They remained, they remained the children of their parents, the boys and girls of their village. They brought with them not just their academic training and expertise, but also their knowledge of their own communities. In other words, students should never be separated from their social roots, and it was out of that endeavor that the program of community development was, de was devised. It was a canon of principle that the manner in which the student engaged with communities had to be different. It had to issue out of their liberatory consciousness. It could not be merely a charitable exercise. The development had to result in human development and had to be a tool of conscientization. The people were to share with the students in the work the projects had to be identified by the communities and assessed by them, and students made a commitment to serve in those communities. To assist in this, a group of us undertook training in, lit in literacy training using Paulo Freire's psychosocial method of adult basic education. The projects were not just about literacy training, of course, but they ranged from clinics, building schools as volunteers, and being engaged in agriculture. Paulo Freire, however, provided valuable tools of reading social phenomena and learning by doing. The result was that it created in the students a, a strong affinity with the communities. And although these projects were not necessarily a success in every respect, they did build in the students a liberatory character. There was another dimension to this building up of a, revolution, a revolutionary cadre. It was that there was a program of formation schools where training and discussion and debate about issues and theories took place. I suggest that this brought about a vanguard group who became the core of the black consciousness leadership. In summary then, Steve Biko and black consciousness began from a curiosity about human experience, raised questions that had no answers and perhaps would never have satisfactory finite answers. Next, they had a theoretical foundation for their intellectual quest, 
And finally, they sought a liberatory praxis that gave effect to their ideals. What is clear is that black consciousness drew ideas from a wide spectrum of thought and practice, from African culture and traditions to European philosophy and modern revolutionary practice. The radical effect of drawing on the language of consciousness could easily be lost sight of. It was radical in that none of South Africa's liberation formations hitherto had used that language, even though black consciousness could be traced back as far back as the 1930s. It was radical in that it sought to find explanation for the pathetic state of resi resignation, conquest after conquest, that was evident in the early 1960s. It was to give new life to the quest for liberation. Nigerian philosopher Emmanuel Chupudi Eze, in his book Reason, Memory, and Politics, gives expression to this in a very helpful explanation of W.E.B. Du Bois's expression, double consciousness. By that, of course, Du Bois was referring to the split personality of the racially oppressed to seek to be both American and African, to seek freedom as human, but having to contend with paralyzing pathological fear and self-doubt. But Du Bois went further. He also believed that redemption and integrity were to be found in the pursuit of a higher self, and that this quest could start only when the injustices of slavery and colonization and the ideologies of racial supremacy and their legacies had been recognized and dismantled. In that sense, the Negro, in Du Bois' own words, rather than become a mere victim, becomes rather a revolutionary subject, a person with second sight, the fruits of wisdom, survival, and hope. It is through this self-actualization and struggle through this double consciousness that one achieves an original universal compact. This lecture would also not be of much value if it did not serve as a prelude to examining the phenomenon of youth and student activism in South Africa today. I offer my thoughts on this not because I suggest that young people and students today were necessarily continuous with the generation that we were part of. Nothing could be further from the truth. It has to be recognized that young people and students of our time belong to a different past and a new future and in their own context. The landscape in South Africa has changed radically from that which our generation and those that came after us had to confront. Having said that, the dynamics of youth and student consciousness are a necessary subject of study because they may throw light on the kind of society we might face or provide answers to current developments in society. The first observation to make is that youth and student organized formations are a mere mirror of the society in which they live in. One finds that by and large student and youth formations are reflective of the mother bodies they are hewn from. These are dominated in our country at least by the ANC Youth League which is often in contention with the South African Communist, the South African Students' Congress, and the Young Communist League. All three organizations profess to be affiliated to or in alliance with the African National Congress. It is of interest, however, that the same organizations are in contention with one another, especially at university campuses. In some respects, the ANC Youth League does not trust SASCO or believes that it ought to be under its wing, and the Young Communist League is in ideological contention with the ANC Youth League, all three organizations present that they advance the liberatory themes of the liberation movement. Of no small interest to me, at least, is that the Young Communist League that is very voluble in opposition to the ANC Youth League and in support of the South African Communist Party and the leadership of the ANC President, uh, President Zuma, one then has to ask, what is the ideological principle on which this party is based? May I suggest that there is none? As a matter of fact, the South African Communist Party is only communist by name. I'm not aware of any Marxist-Leninist policies it campaigns on, 
and it does not appear to have any aspiration to or a program of government of its own. What it does is to support not just an ANC agenda, but also its discredited leadership. It is in cahoots with probably the most corrupt and backward conservative ANC that has ever been, and one which has excelled in corruption and misgovernance. The best I can do to understand this is that perhaps it is a party that sees itself as a pressure group that does not seek power for itself to transform the political landscape of the country, but to influence the processes of patronage and benefit for the few. The ANC Youth League, once allied to President Zuma, once allied to President Zuma and the victorious Pulupana faction of the ANC, has fallen foul of the leadership, largely because it pronounced, maybe prematurely, its view that President Zuma was not re-electable. With amazing swiftness, the president of the ANC Youth League was tried in what to me is a kangaroo court and expelled from that organization. With similar agency, he is now facing a criminal charge of money laundering. One must also state that the ANC Youth League has been advancing their idea of economic liberation that includes the nationalization of mines and the mineral wealth, as well as the appropriation of land resources without compensation. It has also been vocal in their idea of transgenerational leadership of the party and government. Frankly, a great deal of this has not been thought through, and maybe it is inco incoherent. One must, however, grant that there is some serious thinking going on there, a critique of leadership and an analysis of the economic policy choices that the ruling party has advanced. The response of the president of the ANC has been patronizing. Young people must not speak out of turn. They must seek the advice of the elders before voicing their own opinions. It appears that the youth in the ANC have been silenced and marginalized. The only campus-based organization among these is SASCO. SASCO has had to navigate a careful path between the extremes of the ANC Youth League and the repressive impulses of the leadership of their party. Where they dominate SRCs and campuses, they are focused improperly, in my view, on campus disruptions, on a campaign for free education, and in an unsavory interest in tenders and wielding control for resources on campus. But there are other groups that articulate alternative discourses in this minefield. The South African Union of Students is a federation of SRCs and is not party affiliated. It is underfunded and it is marginalized. Its focus has been to build leadership capacities among SRCs so that they may represent the interests of the students properly and build an intellectual class in society. It is worth making the further observation that recent trends suggest that a growing number of students on campuses are voting for the student formations affiliated to opposition parties or to some independents. It is also important to point out in this survey that there is a movement of students who have no desire to get caught up in this organizational fracas, but would rather engage in critical intellectual projects, associate themselves with progressive ideas about Africa, ethics, leadership, and transformation. They are the student leaders who seek mentors outside of the scope of the established political formations. The picture that emerges is no different from studies found in Cameroon and Nigeria post-authoritarian rule. In his study, Jude Fokwang of Cameroon paints a dismal picture with the students interviewed at the most ambiguous in their modes of navigating a troubled terrain. On the other hand, there are those who seek to insinuate themselves into the political bureaucratic lifelines of the regime, including the loyalist thugs who are more than ready to beat up those who do not fall into line. On the other hand, there are those who stay out of the ruling party politics out of principle, but seek to mobilize other networks and lines of patronage, often looking to bribe themselves into the heart of the system, the prestigious schools, the well-connected arenas and institutions that allow them to pursue their expectations of personal advancement. Viewed against the backdrop of Steve Bigger and Black Consciousness, incubated at university campuses 
during the worst periods of repression, what is it that we can read about youth and students in South Africa today? First, it is to state that youth and students have a vested interest in the manner in which society is governed and the manner in, the manner in which public resources are being utilized. That is of value not so much because invariably students and youth are affected by corruption and the paucity of ideas to drive the economy in a progressive manner, but also that the moral character of society lays the foundation for a society that values education, offers prospects for advancement, assures professional opportunities, and creates an environment where they may grow their own values and their own futures. No young person or student would wish to grow up in an environment where there are no prospects of employment or advancement because of the collapse of the economy, or to find that those without any training or education are more valued than those who spend time advancing their education. Secondly, and related to this, it becomes important that a knowledge society be developed whereby learning and lifelong learning becomes a culture and that intellectuals can generate innovative ideas and that they could contribute to societal development. In South Africa at present, it is fair to suggest that we are in danger of growing a generation of young people without hope of a better future. There is much rhetor rhetoric that is mere words, with very little moral leadership and conduct that leads to the realization of declared principles and policy. Young people and students are frustrated from being part of and actors in an argumentative democracy. Instead, the political youth and students only buy their time and serve as mouthpieces of a failed leadership who they are expected to keep quiet and listen to. Nothing could more undermine a knowledge paradigm in society. It also translates to the environment at university campuses where academic freedom and institutional independence are honored only in breach, it creates a society of fear and intellectual dishonesty. There cannot therefore be much joy or hope for students and young people in a society that by word or deed undermines their aspirations to education. To express this in the language of Cornell West, it is a case of nihilism, the lived experience of coping with a life of horrifying meaninglessness hopelessness, and most important, lovelessness. Nana Anidoho argues that failure to recognize the pernicious effect such conditions in society have on, on scholarship would be prejudicial. For her, radical scholarship must be grounded in the life conditions of people as an insider-outsider. It means that we need to understand clearly the Archimedes principle, and where we stand in order to move the world. Without that radical awareness, it is never likely that scholars can produce any scholarship of change, and that will better the lives of people. Scholarship ethics and integrity, of course, affect the students and lecturers and researchers one works with. She concludes that research by its nature is, is about taking a stand, and to do so is to be political. One understands that one cannot allow one's intellectual pursuits to become programs by considerations outside of one's own scholarly activities. Third, control of public resources means that so many young people and students aspire not so much for education at the highest levels they can achieve, but to become millionaires through tenderpreneurship and not by innovation, entrepreneurship and opportunity. This means that young people shadow their elders and work towards patronage, as that would be the only lifeline to change their own conditions. Students and youth in such circumstances could, says Bjorn Beckman, uh, also be able to give voice to popular grievances rooted in the aspirations and struggles for national liberation. It acted as a trustee, as a custodian, and as a mouthpiece of such popular aspirations. What, arguably, has happened in South Africa is that youth and students of this generation have been caught up in the toxic atmosphere of the national politics that undermine their ability to become the voice for an alternative political culture. 
The best they can hope to become is to end up swiftly, as swiftly as possible in ministerial offices or senior government positions with minimal competence for the jobs they do, or spouting spin doctrine for corrupt leaders, or benefiting from patronage in terms of tenders or other party privileges. In a recent speech, University of Free State Vice-Chancellor Jonathan Janssen, an educationist, was bemoaning the fact that exemplars and role models for young people have become uneducated people, powerful in political life of the nation, and others who have amassed wealth without any need for educational achievement. For all these reasons, public discourse has become stultified in non-debate about non-issues. That is not because there are no life and death issues. If one has regard to the lamentable state of the economy, resulting in high unemployment. This is due to failed, ineffectual and inappropriate economic policies that have been adopted that continue to cause what may be an uncontrollable, uncontrollable social inequalities. Meanwhile, we have a government that does not appear to have any sense of the crisis in its hands and that is bound to explode any moment. Again and again, we are reminded by flashpoints of xenophobic violence and persistent racism that we are a nation divided by race and that social cohesion is not just something one pronounces but a governmental and transformative program to be pursued. <coughs> the President says that there is no problem. All is well. That, just as an unprecedented, as unprecedented whilst cat strikes in the mining industry have shut down production and the transport strike has meant that the economy is under squeeze. And at a time when the education system by general acceptance is in crisis and when unemployment is at its highest level, no wonder that he can afford to have the state pay millions of rent for the upgrade of his private residence and to spend unprecedented amounts of upgrades on official residences. With that, there is a lamentable marginalization of the voices of reason and a government that pretends that it can hop along on one leg and get somewhere fast, while a large majority of South Africans at home and the many other patriots who have left their homeland in utter despair to ply their professions in Europe, the Americas and Australia, or the large army of expatriates in Ireland who are not valued and drawn into the National Development Project in sufficient numbers. Taking a leaf out of Biko, it is fair to suggest, I think, that young people and students will be taking charge of shaping their own future. They will need to do so once they are infused with idealism for a better world. They will have to state to themselves that what we have will not produce for them and future generations well-being and a better life. This is an intellectual exercise. For that, we need more young people staying longer at school and students who qualify in their studies and remain to undertake graduate studies. It also requires young people and students who are rooted in the experience of their communities and to avoid the lure of instant riches and prestige of office. It means a critical approach to life and a sense of freedom by which they live their lives. It means that they abjure expediency for principle. That is, after all, what Steve Biko achieved in his lifetime in a life of sacrifice that today shapes the thinking of many for a better world. I dare, I dare to end with the reflections from Cornell West once again, who suggests that nihilism in the black experience can only be defeated and subverted through leadership, and I quote, that exemplifies moral character, integrity, and democratic statementship within itself and its organizations, unquote. This he terms the politics of conversion, that stays on the ground among the toiling everyday people, ushering forth humble freedom fighters, both followers and leaders, who have the audacity to take the nihilist threat by the neck and turn back its deadly assaults." Unquote. I end. Thank you.
We have time for questions. Um, I'm going to open the floor just now. Can I ask you first to be brief so that we can take as many questions as possible? Introduce yourself again briefly and if you would wait for the microphone before you ask your question. So who would like to start? The gentleman in the middle there first. I'm going to take about two or three together. So if you could keep your hands up then I can Please. Thank you, Prof. Uh, I want to defend the youth of South Africa. My name is Tsebo. I, I found it interesting, uh, and I've seen the same thing with the Steve Bigo Foundation, that in your talk, you do not have anything to say about the continued hegemony of whiteness in South Africa. You, you had nothing to say about the fact that poor people are squeezed, yes, by a repressive state, but also that in civil society, at universities and also the economy, uh, where people still continue to dominate, uh, and that all universities, including UNISA, still, you know, are dominated by Eurocentric epistemologies. You know, and, and I wonder why is that? And as I said, I've noticed the same thing with the Steve Bigel Foundation, focus on, you know, medical issues, but you know, issues of whiteness are completely silent. Thank you. Okay, I'll, I'll take the questions all together, and then we'll come back to them. So, one minute. The middle there on the edge. Thank you. Hello, my name is Dania. Um, I am from South Africa, but I have not been living in the country for more than eight years, um, so perhaps my knowledge is not uh, good enough. But my question is uh, relates to the real democracy that we have now in South Africa. As the ANC dominates elections, does that not? Uh, you mentioned the three youth movements within the universities, all who had allegiances to towards the ANC. Do you see? Um, the youth coming out of South Africa and breaking away from that in the future. Um, uh, the youth that didn't grow up in apartheid have the history of it but not the memory of it. Do you think they'll start to challenge that and then put more pressure on the ANC to make changes because there's actually an opposition that wants to challenge them? Thank you. And then the gentleman on the far side there. Hi, my name is Eugene Skeef. Um, Mine is a very brief affirmation. If I knew how to ululate and bring these walls down, I'd do it. I, am, uh, I haven't felt so emboldened in all my years in exile. I worked with Bani Pitiana and Steve Biko and the rest of them, and I know Gosinati as a, as a child because I was close to his family. I just want to say I'm very, very inspired to return home. You've given me more hope than I've had in 32 years of being in exile to return to go and do the work, to continue the work that we started. Thank you. Would you like to reply to those and then I'll take some more after. Thank you, Eugene. Thank you very much for that. It's good to see you. <laughs> Can I just say um, the very, very important question of the hegemony of whiteness. Uh, there, there are, I think for me there are two responses to that. One is that um, the hegemony of whiteness, in some ways, is addressed by affirming uh, black identity and, and, and indigenous knowledge and the capacity of indigenous knowledge systems to actually produce knowledge. And there's a, there's a strong movement happening in South Africa in that regard. My second response is that um, uh, so-called hegemony of whiteness only happens, and I think this is a Hegelian notion, only happens to the extent that in fact there is no challenge from other ideas sufficient to actually bring it into conversation. And in our experience in black consciousness, there was a response to black consciousness which was white consciousness which we deliberately uh, didn't consider that to be the role of black consciousness to shape white consciousness. But in fact, white consciousness was capable of being shaped because there was black consciousness. If there wasn't black consciousness, it wouldn't be necessary uh, to shape white consciousness, in my view. So, so the view we took that instead of going on to try and do exactly what we don't want, as it were, uh, white ideas to influence us, uh, rather by growing and developing 
a, a way of reasoning, a way of thinking, a way of understanding from our own experience, we are in fact limiting the impact of what you call hegemon of ideas. That, that I think is the best that I can, I can say to that. Let me also say that um, there is in fact uh, in South Africa at almost all places uh, a very, a very, uh, I wouldn't say strong. There is a movement that really seeks to address these issues that you, that you, you are, you are bringing out. Uh, to what extent successfully, I cannot tell. But I know that in 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 a number of uh, institutions, in the science councils, um, a great deal of this uh, is actually being addressed. To the second question about um, what the likelihood would be. Um, of, a, of, a, of a new breed of young people coming out of uh, South Africa, what effect would that have? Um, I, at the moment, I don't feel uh, comfortable answering that or even answering it with any confidence. Um, but, but, but in part, I, it's because I, 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 I do think that within the ANC itself, it's always the mistake we make sometimes to see ANC as some monolithic thing. Uh, quite a lot of these, much of the things that I'm saying, are actually being contended within the ANC itself. To uh, degrees of success or failure, I'm not sure. But within ANC itself, among young people, a great deal of these uh, ideas are being generated and thought through. Uh, and, and as you might understand, really for ANC's own survival, it's got to actually engage these, these, these questions. To what extent, I cannot tell. Uh, but I do think that in a healthy environment and healthy society, and hence what I think um, uh, has happened to the ANC Youth League, um, is that I can't imagine how any political party can have a youth organization worth anything if it is clobbered to the extent that I think the ANC Youth League right now has been clobbered. Leave alone the rights or wrongs of uh, whether somebody should have said that or done that, that's another matter. But the, the prospect of having a servile uh, Youth League is frightening uh, to some of us. Thank you. Okay, another round of questions. Woman up there in the purple scarf, and then gentleman in white, and then we'll write right down here in the corner, and I'll come up to you, gentlemen, over there. Okay, please. Good evening, and thank you for the lecture. My name is Alisa. I'm from Niger, and I'm a student here in London at the School of Oriental and African Studies. In my master's class on government and politics in Africa, out of 100 or so students, we have maybe three, maximum four Africans. My question to you is, where are the young and politically awake and active Africans of today who want to make changes? And following from that, what would you advise to us who do intend and hope to go home and get involved in our governments politically, but are afraid that maybe in the process uh, we might have to compromise our integrity or be asked to compromise on our integrity? Thank you. Thank you very much. In the white corner. Uh, I'm, I'm, a, um, I'm a researcher at the LSE and um, in South Africa as well. Um, and um, like probably so many of the, the previous um, people who've asked questions, I've, I've been privileged enough not to grow up in apartheid South Africa. Um, but that's also meant that um, a lot of the, I, I think the Steve Baker's message has been lost to my generation, at least the subtleties of it. So um, I came here sort of expecting a history lesson, but it really wasn't, wasn't that at all. And that, um, it's, it's, I think it's important to recognize that consciousness is not something about South African nationalism or about um, any kind of nationalism or, or, or racialized identity, but the, the narrative you frame is really about a, a cosmopolitan kind of, kind of ethics. Um, and I think, I think now I've been I've been to Steve Biko Memorial Lectures in South Africa, and I think it's important to actually this idea of location and why why this is happening here as well, uh, why we're having it here. So, um, so I'm interested in this idea of this Anglo-African um, um, kind of dialogue that that, that you're, you're bringing up here, um, and what you say about kind of this, this kind of toxic politics in the world today, where presidents and prime ministers are saying 
Everything's great and getting better. Um, can, you, can you draw that into a question for us? Because I do have some others waiting. So. Well, the question is, what is the question, really, um, it, to, to um, Professor Petiana? Uh, um, in these, these kinds of conditions, it's radicalization of religiosities, nationalism around the world. What do you think is the, the pressing questions of our time that moves away from kind of racializations and nationalism? Thank you very much. Can I just bring in the woman at the bottom here in the striped jumper? Hi, um, my name is Masana. I'm a current student at the University of Cape Town and I just started eight days ago at LSE. Um, I have a background in politics and economics and social justice and African studies. I'm very confused. Welcome. As you can tell. Um, so my question, and it centers a lot around my thesis, which looked at the future of black consciousness and economic development in Africa, particularly as it relates to the South African Council of Churches, is you know sort of this combination of the ideological and the practical together. And I know you spoke a lot about how you know what we have taking place is the focus and development in South Africa on the material, but not actually paying any attention to the ideological and moral compass that guides society. Um, and in the famous words of Steve Biko, and particularly as it probably aims to relate to affirmative action as black man, you are on your own. Um, encouraging people to buy black, encouraging people to participate in this sort of uh, Afro-consciousness commercialization, which is my own academic talk. <laughs> And I just wanted to find out what is the future of black consciousness and economic development, particularly as it relates to South Africa. You know, how can you create policies that you know um, encourage not just the material realization of affirmative action, but also this guiding principle? So I'm asking more about the how, really. Thank you very much. I'm, we're, we're running short of time and I want Barbara to finish off, so I'm going to take the last couple of questions. There are two on this side, so if the two gentlemen and then the man behind you. So please, yes. Thank, thank you. Uh, my name's Rohan, uh, a member of the public, uh, not connected with LXE. Uh, I think my question's fairly similar to, to two that have come previously. You, you talked about the, the issue of students that seek self-advancement uh, and uh, Gramsci, for instance, talks about the, the complicity of um, intellectuals <coughs> with the regime. And uh, there are theorists like Pierre Bourdieu who, who talk about how education and uh, high school and, and perhaps tertiary uh, inculcate uh, individuals into a current regime. If, uh, if um, there's an increasing secularization in society and if um, um, the ob obvious signs of apartheid have been overcome, where are the uh, sources of power or, or inspirations that will ensure or allow students uh, to overcome obvious inequalities in, in current society? Thank you very much. And the last question just behind you, so if you just pass it over your shoulder. Yes, thank you. you. My name is Ludwig. I'm a, a student here at the LSE. I would just like to ask a question. You mentioned that the students of today in South Africa, they, they seem to be living in a world where there's no hope or joy. Um, for the future. Do correct me if I'm wrong on this, but that seems to be, in my opinion, something similar to how you would, have, when you were living under the apartheid. Um, I mean, I, I never grew up on the apartheid, but it does seem that when you and Steve Biko um, cre like came up with these ideas of black consciousness and student activism, that there were similar situations. So do you think in today's situ uh, current situation that the students of today have to come up from from the start again, that they have to create something new um, in the same way that you and Steve Biko did as well. And if they do have to do that, do you think it's going to be in a similar fashion of a black dominated debate for the future of South Africa, or is it going to be more of a mix with whites, blacks, and, and coloreds as well? Um, that's my question is what's going to happen with student activism? Okay. Right. Thank you very much. Uh, we should thank everybody who. Um, offered questions and comments um, uh, in response today. Um, I'm not sure that uh, I can cover all of the points uh, that were raised. I can understand the concerns of uh, African young people and students today 
um, about uh, what their role would be as they uh, go back to do uh, what is a patriotic duty, if you like, uh, going back to their country to, to serve. Um, the best possible way I could think of is that they continue to go and serve and endeavor to serve in a manner uh, that produces and causes uh, the possibilities, at least, of sustainable change uh, uh, in the places where they are. Um, and that, of course, in most respects, is not going to be an individual effort. Uh, it's going to be an organizational effort working with others um, to, to form uh, such a, a, a nucleus uh, of people committed to serving but committed to change as well. Of course, you know, every uh, context is different. And everybody will have to just consider that context, uh, the, his or her own context, uh, judiciously. And, and, and I would imagine uh, um, any endeavor of that nature must begin exactly as um, I suggested has been the process in the manner in which Steve Bigo was operating to really take account of one's own environment. And that I couldn't possibly take the matter any further than that. But the hope that uh, a new generation of students and young people uh, would dare to imagine uh, a different future than the one that they found um, must be tantalizing and, 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 and exciting. And that's all I can say, or indeed hopeful. Um, I couldn't quite understand the, 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 the point about the uh, nationalism narrative. Uh, clearly, if I may say so, what really was uh, I was trying to outline is um, to give a theoretical analysis of black consciousness as it evolved and what it was having to contend with. Um, and I was trying to say that given all of those theoretical and other uh, conditions that uh, Steve Bigger and others had to work under, uh, they, they, they managed and needed to develop their own praxis as to how best they can actually engage their own society of their own time. Uh, I imagine uh, uh, students and young people today will find their own practice in, in their own time. Uh, it's not for me to say what the nature of that would be, but there are very clear, I think I suggest, there are certain very clear fundamental issues that need to be addressed. Uh, inequality, um, uh, the, the, the argumentative democratic environment in which they live, how they grow and, and, and how they contribute towards a better society and a better economy. That's all I can say. I don't think I can take that any more than that. Um, and clearly, uh, in campuses, I mean, the groups I was talking about actually uh, in South Africa today, in theory at least, are not necessarily black. And in, in principle at least, they are not seeking to advance blackness, okay, um, in the manner in which Steve Bigot did. Uh, as I understand it, uh, they are concerned about the issues of youth and students. But how they do it is, is a matter of difference. Uh, how Are there any strategies? Are those strategies uh, actually important? I wish um, my sister there, who is working on uh, black consciousness and development and the work of SACC, um, uh, the, the very best. I don't think in this environment I can uh, do much more than that. And I think you seem to, to, to have got what you want to do. And I don't know that I can add anything uh, to what you are saying. It is my view, though, that uh, any, any aspiring intellectual and, and student who's really serious about the future um, today, if you have a situation of um, uh, graduates uh, who leave university uh, uh, for four years being unable to find a job, uh, to work with a degree. If you want uh, uh, find uh, people, um, young people, students, uh, who are not able to really feel uh, uh, that any endeavor they make is, is appreciated, uh, where education is not valued, it's bound to be a very difficult environment uh, for the people to, 
to work as young people. And therefore, I think it is fair to say there's bound to be hopelessness, lovelessness, joylessness in such an environment. I can't imagine anything else. But of course, there are others who are very resilient and bounce back out of it and grow out of it and become better people as a result. But one can't say that that would be the case for everybody. And my last word is to, to say thank you very much, uh, Professor Kelly, for um, uh, uh, driving us uh, uh, safely uh, uh, this evening and bringing this to an end. Thank you. Well, well let, let, let me finish, Barney, if I may, by just saying, for me, the narrative been un- has been unfamiliar, although many of the names you mentioned are not. I mean, I've had the experience of teaching some of the thinkers you mentioned, not least Hegel, Students don't always get it, but you've provided a wonderful answer to some of their questions and challenges. I'll refer them to your podcast and tell them to listen and learn. (laughs) Your emphasis on the link between consciousness, liberation, and activism is still deeply important, not least to the youth that you're also addressing here and that you show concern for. This has been how shall I put it, an erudite, an informative, and I think a morally profound lecture for which we are deeply grateful. So can I ask you to join with me in thanking our speaker tonight. Before the camera goes off, can I just say two other things? First, can I thank all of you for your participation, and particularly the questioners and those who didn't get the opportunity to ask their questions. I think this has been a great success. And then finally, it is a tradition of the Steve Biko Foundation to present the lecturer with a portrait. So can I ask, again, invite Mr. Biko to uh, come and make the presentation to our And I'll thank you all for attending. We're finished.